Greetings all. Welcome back to another session of Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to be talking about computer mediated communication. It's the new way of communicating. There are a lot of things that are involved here and the important thing is how we can use this when we uh, educate others when we're using this in teaching. That's the main thing that's going to be talking about here today. So we're going to be looking at email and uh, other types of communication systems like MOOS and conferences <clears throat> and uh, other communication devices. There are some things to consider when you're using uh, a CMC, a, com a computer mediated uh, communications device. One thing is time, and there are social and psychological implications. And then there are also linguistic, material, and individual considerations that you should be thinking about. Let's first begin <clears throat> about uh, talking a little bit about uh, CMC and the changes in the way people communicate. As you know, years ago, that's all they had was a phone. Um, and so everybody used the phone and the phone book to get information. Today, I have not seen anybody use a phone book. Phone books are still delivered, as far as I can tell, but nobody uses them. You put them in a box or put them in a corner or some people just throw them away because all the information they need is now on the web. So they can get information more quickly. They use cell phones now instead of landlines. Uh, more and more families are not even buying a landline. Uh, um, so they're, they're doing it in, in, a, in a different way using this new medium. Um, some people can use internet phones um, uh, to do things or use the internet to make phone calls uh, because of the, uh, the merging of these two systems. Um, so you can have synchronous communications, and that's things like an internet phone or a conference, um, all right, or a video phone. Okay, and then there are quasi-synchronous or nearly synchronous things like a chat or an IRC or a MOO, where there's a small delay between the typing of one message after it gets sent, all right, and then the reading of it on the other side. Uh, most people will probably call it synchronous, but it's actually a little bit off, right? And then there's asynchronous, things like email or uh, bulletin board services or listservs where a message is sent and it may be hours or even days before a response comes back. Um, so, But those are, are three different types of communication that you use in computer-mediated communications. Let's take a look at the, the, uh, the first uh, two here, email and, and SMSs. These are the most often used, <clears throat> even today, um, text messages and, uh, and email. Uh, emails are often monolingual. Sometimes they're bilingual. Um, the email system that I use is bilingual. If you're, you're on a, uh, a computer system that allows multiple languages, then you can do that. But by and large, they're one, they're one uh, language or possibly two. Uh, another type of system that's out there is something called tandem email. This isn't really actually a system. It's a way of teaching. Um, where one side will write in one language and the other side will write in another language and so they're or they're writing in the same message twice in, in two different languages and it's a way for students or people to learn language from another person because they can copy back and forth um, the ideas that are encased in them so par partners can copy and, and uh, even correct e each other's emails and whatnot to help them learn language then there are text messages or, or SMSs, short messaging system. That's what SMS stands for. It's primarily used with phones. And uh, so if you're ever sending off phones, you can send off messages rather quickly. You can send off multiple ones uh, very quickly. They get sent through the phone system. They generally don't cost the phone company very much. Um, and so uh, it's another way to send messages. Used very much today. Uh, I'm told that a lot of teenagers in the United States use it in an effort to avoid face-to-face -face communications, uh, even avoid phone uh, conversations, not because they want to save money, but because they want to uh, create some distance. They're also nice if you're in a crowd and you want to send a message rather discreetly without having to leave the room or get on the phone, you can just send a message. Uh, the nice thing about short messages is that our language learners can use this uh, short message system to learn language because short messages are easier for second language learners to digest. Now, with second, I'm sorry, with uh, short message uh, systems, with SMS, with chat messages, uh, text messages, oftentimes the vocabulary and the grammar is truncated uh, or reduced in such a way that it's not the same as uh, a n normal conversational or normal written. Uh, English, but still there are things that they could learn through it. 
and it's a tool that they have readily available to them. They generally have a phone, and uh, they use them. <clears throat> We have chat, and you've seen uh, chat programs before. Uh, in the past, chat programs were pretty much standalone type things, uh, like uh, like AOL and Yahoo had chat programs, and uh, um, uh, IRCs as well. You could go and <clears throat> and chat in one of those. Um, the difference is that today now most chat programs are incorporated with the other types of systems, like uh, um, an internet phone. Uh, or video chat or other type of thing. Uh, they used to be separated, but they're not anymore. They are similar to face-to-face -face in one sense, in that you can have some comprehension checks when you do this. You can ask for clarification. Uh, you can do this in multiple languages, right? Uh, you can uh, self-correct. So there's a higher attention to focus, higher attention to form when you're doing uh, chats as opposed to when you're doing something just orally. <clears throat> Uh, there's a higher attention to form because you're put typing out this message and you're thinking to yourself as you go, is this right? Is this proper? <clears throat> uh, chats also provide a better snapshot to the interlanguage. Um, again, as you're seeing these students, and because they're thinking and contemplating more when they write than when they speak. Uh, downside of chats is that it's a very high affective filter. Uh, students are writing and they realize that someone at the other end is waiting and so they have more pressure to produce in written form, and it creates a much higher affective filter. Additionally, conversations may not end smoothly, as in a normal conversation. You know, two people are talking, and then when they're done, you know, when one person finishes, then the other person begins type of thing. And when you know a topic is over, you know, someone segues into something else. Oftentimes in a chat, you, you may segue, but then that person responds with something that you said earlier in the discussion. And so it, they don't close as, as neatly. Um, so uh, that cause some, some type of uh, disruptions. And then there's this whole concept of anonymity. People think that when they get on a chat or a bulletin board or an IRC that they can be anonymous. And that way they're going to say and do whatever they want. But in reality, uh, you are not uh, anonymous. You may be anonymous to some. Um, but uh, your computer has an IP number. And for most people, that locks you into where you are, what country you're from, where, what location you're in. They should be able to f use that information to track you down. So you're really not anonymous, even though you think you are. Even linguistically, uh, people who get on and uh, other people can identify who they are because of the way that they write. Uh, not even through the technological, but through uh, writing analysis. So, you're actually not anonymous in that sense. Moos, moos, um, <clears throat> um, are uh, virtual environments where people can meet and chat and uh, um, interact. Generally, uh, it can be text-based. And uh, it's kind of like a virtual world. Uh, it's a multi-user domain, and it's object-oriented, so that you can create objects while you're in there as well. But it's just a like a little virtual world where people can get together and meet and interact and do things. Um, and then there are those that are text-based. So you you know you're walking somewhere and you do it textually, or you can do them graphically, which are more interesting because then you get to walk around and and uh, play with things. And then there are full AV virtual reality systems that are quite expensive. Um, but again, you actually get to be in that environment and walk around and interact with people, uh, talk with them, do things with them um, on, the, uh, on the Internet, right, on the Internet. Now, you get to encounter authentic language. If you have students who go into a place like this, they get real language because the most of the people who are there are native speakers. Uh, you get to do some tandem learning where one can teach another while they're online. Of course, there is a stigma, and that's the big thing that I see with um, uh, multi-user uh, games, um, and that's that um, it looks like a game. Um, because it looks like a game, there are going to be a lot of teachers who may not be interested in getting involved in one of these. It is very game-oriented, but you have to know to use the language. <clears throat> In, as far as formal language is concerned, this is probably not the place to be. Uh, but as far as informal, incidental uh, learning, it's an excellent place to be. Uh, students can come here and play with the language, interact, learn from others as they're right, as they're reading what they're doing or 
um, uh, interacting with them uh, verb, uh, orally if, if you're using that kind of a system. So MOOCs can provide a lot of neat things for uh, second language learners. Uh, but at the same time, it can also be overwhelming in a place like this because you have very few, uh, um, you have very few scaffolded uh, elements in there to help you communicate as you go along. I mean, if you go in there and and you don't know language very well, people are just going to walk away from you. People are just going to ignore you. So, um, but definitely a neat opportunity. <clears throat> A couple of other things that can be done here uh, online as far as um, communicating. One is conferences, uh, and there are a multitude of uh, conference type software uh, that's up there. You can use this for distance education, for research. Uh, some of them cost, like uh, NetMeeting, and some of them are free, like uh, WizIQ or Digital Samba. Um, there we go. Um, so, for example, we can go to something like uh, GoToMeeting, uh, and it's a virtual place where you can get together and meet and talk, and you have a virtual conference. You can share uh, content and chat. You can. There's probably a whiteboard here, so there's a lot of things you can do, but you have to host a meeting to do this. Okay, It's going to cost something in order to get in here, right? Digital Samba, same type of system. You can meet and teach and present. Uh, in this type of a system. So you can have uh, your classes here and have a virtual learning environment. Um, this also is, uh, again, you have a whiteboard, you can uh, upload documents, okay, similar to NetMeeting. Um, and again, this one has a pricing plan. Okay. And then there's something like uh, WizIQ. So again, same type of system where you can have a meet with your students online. You can interact with them, you can upload documents, you can um, uh, you, know, you can share documents, you can use a whiteboard, those types of things. Uh, it's a very nice thing. WizIQ, rather interestingly, has inter interfaces to a lot of the course content management systems that are available, so you can hook this into Blackboard or Moodle or even build your own um, API. <coughs> And uh, lastly, I wanted to show you uh, Google's Hangout. Google Hangout is not, specifically speaking, a conference uh, type of software like the other ones are, but it is a place where you can have multiple users getting together to talk, to share documents, um, to share a Google document, for example, to um, share uh, YouTube, so there are a number of things that they can do in a system like that. It doesn't cost, and that's one of the nice things about it. So you've got a system there that doesn't cost, as opposed to all the other ones that at some point do cost. Uh, and that's Google Hangouts. One of the things you want to be concerned about with uh, conferences is bandwidth uh, demands. The more video you're pushing, the more speed you're going to need. So um, you may want to do something that requires less Less uh, streaming uh, to you if you don't have a lot of bandwidth. You'll want to go to something that doesn't have uh, video, that maybe it just has presentation type of thing. Uh, there are also internet phones, uh, things like Skype and Gtalk and Uvu. Um, these things have a smaller bandwidth footprint. Um, they generally allow fewer participants, um, but, uh, um, well, they allow fewer participants, and they allow fewer things that you can do. There's probably less sharing of uh, documents, although you can pass documents back and forth. Um, and so some of those are some of the drawbacks of these. Now, of course, most of these are free, right? Um, one of the downsides of Internet phones and with something like Hangout is that uh, everybody can talk. You don't have any control. Hangout allows everybody to talk. With systems like Digital Samba or WizIQ, the leader of the group can control who talks. And so those are nice. But with things like Skype, <clears throat> uh, it's basically an internet phone. You can use it in a classroom, but that also means that anybody can talk at the same time. Uvu is going to be the same type of system. The advantage of Uvu is uh, that you can have more people on the system at once. I believe this does up to 12 uh, videos you can do at the same time. And again, that's nice, but that also means that um, also means that uh, you're going to have some distractions because there are so many people talking. 
there's great potential in second in uh, second language learning with these things. You overcome distances. You have uh, overcome the buildings. Overcome time barriers. Okay, someone's in Germany at the time. That's okay. Get on Skype. You can still have your your class. All right. You have to go to you know you have to go to California. You have to go to Hawaii for a conference, but you have a class. Well, you can use any of these and continue your course, provided of course everybody has the software, which uh, some of these are free, and provided of course you have uh, internet access. Um, so there are some big advantages to that. You're teaching in uh, you're teaching in Hungary, and you want to have your students talk with students here in the United States. Okay, you find a teacher or, or a group of people who are willing to get on at the same time. You can do that. Uh, it's a great tool to have in things like that. Um, okay, so that's those. Let's jump on to a couple other things here. Let's look at emails. Uh, and bulletin boards and forums a little bit. They're a little different because, again, there's a delay in the interaction. You send the email and you have to wait for a response. Same thing with a bulletin board. You may get a response. You may get a response within minutes, but you may not get a response for days. Um, go on a bulletin board and post a message, and every now and again you'll see someone who's posted a message, and then they post a second message, you know, like two days later, and they say, Hello? Anybody out there? Because they want a response, but nobody's responded to them. All right, so there's a time delay. Um, it's good for second language learners because it actually provides them time to respond. We talked a little bit earlier about chat programs. Chat programs because there's this time, there's this demand. I, I'm waiting. I need an answer now. It adds more pressure to your students. But this one doesn't. allows them time to communicate and think about what they're going to say before they write it down. Uh, and so this is also used in multimodal learning where you have a variety of modes that you can learn. You can, you can uh, use this in that system as well. All right, some considerations when uh, using uh, computer-mediated communications, right? One is time. There may be greater time pressure or less time pressure depending on what you're using, right? There may be less attention to form depending on the system, or there may be more attention to form if you're going to be doing something that's more time pressure, right? Uh, timing is everything. Okay, when you're, we're using a system like this, do you add more pressure? Do you add less pressure? You need to know your students. You need to monitor how they're feeling in the system, right? There are also uh, psychological and social uh, considerations, right? Uh, some people feel that uh, uh, being closer is better. You know, they wanna, they don't like this uh, distance. It bothers them. Other people, they like the distance, right? They feel better that way, right? Um, it also can modify your personality. Uh, people who get online and they feel safer at a distance, they're going to uh, they're going to be more more brave when they communicate, right? There's going to be that that person behind the curtain that's sitting over there. That's the real you, but you know you get to be this other person, like in like in Oz, um, because you think nobody can see you and nobody knows who you are. You have that distance, right? For some, it gives you confidence, right? I can do this because nobody's around me. I'm in my little office cubicle or I'm in my, my room and I can do this and I can enter into conversations, right? I have more confidence. There are also some linguistic uh, considerations. Again, you're going to give people more time to communicate. And because they're going to have more time, they can work on creating more complex um, information. If you're dealing with a chat, it's being negative, <clears throat> the conversation could probably be more fragmented and be more truncated because of the nature of chatting. Um, so uh, in a uh, forum, you also have the opportunity to negotiate meeting. In oral phone, phone type of things or conferences, uh, you can negotiate meaning back and forth, and that's an excellent way uh, for second language learners to uh, interact. There is evidence that second language acquisition does occur using these types of tools, and so I would recommend you get involved with them with your students. Now, we also want to take a look at some uh, other considerations, and these are material considerations and also just some of the individual things. Um, the physical properties of the technology can impact how language, uh, how communication is, is used, right? Um, so, for example, an advantage of having a mobile phone is that you can have communication anywhere. And for the most part, people like mobility. They don't like to be tethered to a machine. 
Um, and so that's a good thing. Now, others are going to be tethered to a machine. They're going to be sitting on a <clears throat> at a PC. Now, they've got greater uh, communication tools that they're at the ready, and they're probably glad about that. They have greater bandwidth. They can have multiple people. They can do like a, a Skype or an Uvu and have multiple people because they've got more bandwidth capabilities, unlike a phone, which doesn't. Um, you know, they can share files. They can work on a whiteboard together, um, whereas a mobile phone, people couldn't do that. So you've got toss-ups between them, right? An iPad's going to be, or a, a, a pad, a digital pad is going to be something else. You know, they're going to have a, a hybrid between the two. Um, the nice thing about the more expensive um, uh, phone, uh, um, tablets is uh, uh, their hard drive is growing. And they're now becoming large enough that people are saying, okay, I can put this, I can take this and use this almost like a, a, a hard drive in a, in a computer, in a regular PC uh, so eventually, that's the way the PC is going to go. The big PCs are going to go away, and everything's going to be small enough that you can put it into um, a tablet. All right, lastly, some individual considerations. <clears throat> and those individual considerations are simply that person. They may like technology, okay? So they're going to use it. They're going to jump into it. There are others who may not like technology. Okay? Their, their predisposition to technology is going to change how well they interact uh, using these tools when they want to communicate. Uh, some people, uh, the language of the technology is going to be new vocabulary for them. They're going to have to deal with that. Um, so you've got some individual um, individual preferences. You're going to have people who are just downright afraid of using the technology. Uh, or they think that it's not worth it, right, for some reason. But uh, uh, from my experience, most people who get involved and start learning how to use it and see the benefit through experience, they typically change. Not all of them, but many of them do. I've had a, a couple of students in classrooms when I, when I would ask them about their love for technology, and they were like, no way. Three years later, I see them walking around with a tablet, um, and they're all excited that they can do all of their work right off of this little tablet. And so they changed. Uh, so some of these things can change, but they are things that you should consider when you're getting ready to use this stuff uh, in a in a class or a learning type of setting. Uh, okay, just to do some recap, there are a variety of ways to do your learning here. There's synchronous, quasi-synchronous, and asynchronous. There's a lot of tools for communicating out there. And you ought to be looking at these tools and thinking, hmm, how can I use this? What advantage can I use these tools for? And other things to consider is time. Do you want pressure or not pressure, right? What are the social and psychological things that are involved? How much language do you want them to learn? Is it okay that things are, are truncated, that there's less focus on form, or do you want more focus on form, okay? You gotta look at the material uh, elements that you're using, whether it's a handheld or whether it's a, uh, you know, a PC or a tablet. Uh, you'd be thinking about the material that you're using, and then, of course, the individual considerations. That's all I have for today. I do hope uh, this was enjoyable to you. If you do have any questions, please let me know. I'll talk to you later.